uh, okay. been trying to keep the weekends more relaxed, especially now that gigs are starting to come back, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you got some gigs coming in. Yeah. It's nice. It feels weird actually getting <laughs> asked to do yeah. gigs. I'm like, Oh, wow. Putting, so putting equipment in the so car brutal, and going, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Putting equipment in the car and going to play for other humans. What a concept. Yeah. Putting the amp in the back of the car. Like, wow. <laughs> hey, I think right, I remember how to do this. Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to set up the PayPal. I just want to make sure the live chat Thank is you. enabled. That was that one thing that happened last time. Okay. Uh, I think it should. I'm assuming I have original sound here. Let me double check. If I just said, I mean, it says blue. Let me just hit enable original sound. I'm assuming that was on already, but. That sounds actually better, whatever you just did. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Just hit enable original sound. I should probably do that each time we do a, a class too. Okay, we are live. Let me just make sure the chat is working. You bet. Let some people start coming in. I bet there's a pretty good chance our friend Hal, Hal Merrill will join us. He's quite an interesting pedal steel player, by the way. Yeah, his he has some cool stuff on his channel. Some of those voicings he was able to play on that was wild. Yeah. yeah, I think so too. He's actually doing classical music. He's tried a few of my songs, unusual jazz standards. Wow. He's, He's trying to create some pretty original repertoire for his instrument. That's awesome. Seems like a really nice guy, too. Yeah, very nice man. He's come to a couple of workshops I've done and good guy. He's All right, cool. Nice the guy. live chat is enabled, so that's good. All right, excellent. Excellent. All right, well, we are live. Okay. Mike, great to be with you, and I hope some people will be joining us, but let's just uh, chat on the assumption that some people are either watching or about to watch. How are you feeling? Yeah, we, I am feeling good. Sorry to everybody about having to postpone last week. I got my first vaccine and my arm was feeling a little sore, but luckily it only lasted for a day and uh, things are back to normal. So glad to be here with John as always. Thank you for doing this. Yeah. And Mike, I'm glad you're feeling better. I think you'll bounce back pretty quickly from the second shot too, hopefully, if there's any reaction at all. So Mike and I have been friends for a while now. We started collaborating, doing some uh, lessons together online, co-teaching for the Mike's Masterclass site. And I really like Mike's playing and his teaching. So we've had a lot of fun doing these class collaborations. And is this our third live stream? I'm trying to remember, Mike, or our second. This is number four. Four, wow. Time flies. Yeah, it's been fine by, okay. that's for sure. So, 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 so we will keep doing these also. And I, uh, Mike and I talked before we went live today about trying to do a gig in person together when I'm on the East Coast, maybe this summer. It would be great to do some teaching and playing with you in person. Let's, let's make that happen. Absolutely. So our goal today is just to have a little fun and initially play some songs solo individually and then maybe trade some choruses or eights on some tunes at the end. So that's, I think, the way we'll proceed to what we have in the past. And if you have any comments or questions, we'd love to hear from you. Sounds good. Do you want to go first or? Sure, I'll go first this time. I think maybe you went first last time. What did I do for you? Let's see. Maybe I will do, here's one I played. I'm not sure if I've done this for our live streams, but it's the tune I've been playing for years that I like from uh, Cole Porter using the Bill Evans changes. It's one called Everything I Love. I may have done this on some of our other live streams. <laughs> Thank you. 
Border with Beautiful. Your 11, so I'm kind of sort that was of awesome. Things. What was the name of that song again? Out of time a little. That one's called Everything I Love. I think I've shared that chart with you, but I'd be happy to. It's not super complicated, but Bill added about, it's kind of fun to sort of chat between the tunes like this, the way we do. Hopefully people enjoy this part of the mm -hmm. process too in our live stream. Uh, Bill was fond of inserting a lot of additional harmony. Uh, his own tunes are in, in some cases pretty dense harmonically too, Mike. But in the case of standards, he would do the same thing. So on how deep is the ocean, or in this case, and everything I love, uh, he's inserting a lot of additional chords. And sometimes it's um, secondary dominance, so implied fives or an actual five written in. He's, he likes whole tones, so there's one spot in the tune towards the end where he has dominant chords going down in whole steps, G7, F7, E flat 7, D flat 7, then a long cycle to an A flat major. So you look at it, it's kind of dense, but when you spend a little time with it, uh, same thing with how deep is the ocean. You see all this harmony, but you realize it's very logical. And it is possible to memorize all that. It's not that I mean, you'd have no trouble with it. Mm -hmm. And the trick is trying to negotiate some melodies through all this dense harmony. But it's, you know, in this case, it's pretty diatonic. It's essentially two keys, E flat and G flat. Everything kind of centers around those two keys. Mm -hmm. In some cases with long cycles to get to those chords. But it's, it's pretty logical. And I think it's a beautiful tune. I remember hearing Ray Brown do this with one of his trios, I think with Benny Green. And they did it as a slow bossa nova. This is maybe 20 years ago up out here on the west coast ray was out here with one of his trios and the melody is beautiful it probably works with any kind of a feel or vibe i've done it i've been playing this tune probably for 30 years and my friend jay thomas out here introduced me to it jay is about my age and world-class trumpet and saxophone pretty unusual double i don't know too many people who can play both. yeah that's interesting wow well. <laughs> yeah he started on very young as a trumpet player i think in his maybe probably in his early teens his dad plays trumpet and still active um his dad and so jay and his dad both are out here and uh, so i met jay in the early 80s through a friend here and we've been playing on and off together for years we still play sometimes i'm going to see him actually next month but he started on trumpet very young and then i think picked up tenor maybe when he was in his late teens early 20s so he's been playing both now for 50 years probably maybe longer that's <laughs> fascinating playing. do you know that do you know the saxophone player stacy dillard I, I know the name but i don't know um, he's an alto player, but a friend of mine lived with him for a while, and I think he also doubled on trumpet. I think alto was his main instrument that he would gig on, but he said during the day he would practice trumpet like all day. Yeah. So. Well, there's some guys who just have a penchant, like Jacob Collier, who you probably know about, right. playing really well on about six, seven instruments. <laughs> where I live in, in Portland, named George Colligan, and George is probably now in his oh, amazing, great, great player, incredible. Here. Yeah. He, yeah, he actually picked, and his uh, his wife um, uh, is uh, Carrie Pollitzer, is a wonderful piano player, composer too. So George started, I think, on trumpet when he was a kid, pocket trumpet, which he still plays. And then I think he picked a piano next, and then drums, and he's really good on all three. And sometimes on a gig, he'll play all three. Did he live in Canada at any point? Yeah, he did. He was in, oh, okay. um, where was he? I think it might have been like the middle of Canada. It might have been, I'm trying to remember what town it was, but he had a teaching job there for a while. Right. That's how I found out about him, because because Jimmy Winnipeg, Green from Westcon. Yeah, that's right. I think he was in Winnipeg, actually, mm -hmm. even when Jimmy was up there, too. And then George uh, got a, offered a teaching position here in Portland. So he's tenured now on the faculty here in Port at Portland State. Good faculty here. So George, you know, was has toured quite a bit with people like Jack DeJanette, mm -hmm. Cassandra Wilson, his own trios. I think his own most recent trio was with um, Lenny White and Buster Williams. So oh, know, wow. George was quite active touring until about a year ago. But he had, you know, he has his teaching job here as well. So George is a great multi-instrumentalist, my friend Jay Thomas, a few people do it. Mm -hmm. um, I did a recording and a little bit of work with Don Thompson in the late 90s, early 2000s. And Don is from Vancouver, Canada, but he's been in Toronto for many years. And Don is triple threat vibes, 
bass and piano and he's just as good on all three yeah when i heard him first play piano on that jim hall album i think it's called circles yeah. that opening track i was like who is this yeah. piano player and i look at the personnel don thompson bass and piano like wow yeah yeah <laughs> we did a few duo gigs in toronto and he played both beautifully so i think don's still active yeah i haven't talked to him awesome. in a while but he's a wonderful musician hey why don't you play something for us i'd love to hear you sure um i will continue the theme of the cult order this is a song that i love called all of you it's a good one and oh, just real quick, sorry, because we have eight people watching right now. Uh, thank All you, everybody, right. for tuning in. Uh, if you have any Absolutely. questions for me or John, please feel free to put them in the live chat. We will get to them shortly. Great. Thanks for joining us, everybody. <laughs>
nice, Mike. Lots of Thank great you. open string voicings, kind of Jim Hall, Lenny Bro inflows. Yeah, that key works nice for that because you get that open B, especially for that first chord. You can, yeah. you can get that open B in a lot of different spots. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I discovered that, like this voicing. I like it, combining the um, six and the flat at seven for that first voicing, like B flat, A flat, G. I like the sound of those. Oh, uh, G, um, I'm doing the open G and then the A flat right underneath. And the A flat on top as well, I guess. Nice. Yeah, especially at, uh, they're getting a little nerdy for the folks who are not guitar players. <laughs> guitar players probably watching. Yeah, the open strings are great fun in terms of, especially when you're playing at that tempo where you can let things ring a little bit because you're sitting right. on the chord for a minute. Absolutely. Right. Sounds yeah, I always love that tune. Oh, thank you. Me too. Yeah, it's a good jam session tune. Folks should know that one. It's a good one. Not to be confused with all of you, which is also. I used to always do, I used to do that all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so maybe I'll do another, and unless anyone has any comments or thoughts while we're. While we're uh, the only comment we have so far is uh, for you. It just says "crazy guitar." <laughs> crazy guitar. Yeah, and whoever yes. that is, I can maybe you don't know this instrument. So this guitar, actually, we might both talk about our instruments because they're not. Guitars that would typically be used to be playing, right. be playing jazz on. So in this case, this instrument, maybe you can't see it completely. And then I'll hold it up now so the whole instrument is visible. This was designed and made by a friend of mine named Roscoe Wright, who is still building, but he's not building this particular model anymore. He has a company called Soloette. And Roscoe and his wife, Ati, live out in the Columbia Gorge, about an hour and a half uh, east of Portland now. But I've known him for probably 30 years. And I have two of his instruments. I have the nylon version of this as well. This is steel string. And very clever design. Uh, what looks like a body actually uh, disassembles this part of the instrument. Uh, on either side of the middle of it are essentially plastic tubes to give you the shape of the body covered in cloth that a friend put over the, over the plastic tube. So that part disassembles. So it goes in a case like a fishing rod case, very small. And if I'm flying, I never have to check it. It always goes inside the airplane with me, even smaller commuter jets. Uh, the neck is a solid piece of graphite and the body is a piece of maple two pickups. There's an RMC Piezo and then a DiMarzio Andy Timmons, which again is also not a, a pickup that you normally associate with jazz, but it's got a very good clean sound, high output, but also clean sound. And I've had this guitar about 15 years. It's been all over the planet and I've never had any issues traveling with it. It's been really easy because it's so light and portable and I like the way it sounds. And with a graphite neck, and the action never moves. I haven't touched the truss rod in 15 years. Wow. So How often do you get setups? Uh, never. I mean, I've had the frets I've never polished once in 15 years because I use these light flat wound strings and the guitar is pretty reliable and, and pretty durable. I've been lucky to, I'm, I'm lucky to have it. I have other guitars that look more normal, but this guitar is one of my kind of my go-to instruments. Even if I'm not flying, I'll, I'll take it out and play it pretty often. So just because of the nature of how the guitar is made, you, you don't have to get setups and stuff like that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, oh. occasionally I will have to set up maybe when I, when I buy an instrument, maybe you too, or if I have an instrument made for me, then it requires a little setup when it arrives because I'm kind of picky. I like really low action. And so maybe I have to get it tweaked a little bit when it arrives. Mm -hmm. But usually, you know, as long as I can tell the folks what I need, it works out pretty, pretty, pretty quick, pretty quickly. I can get it done. Oh. And, and this instrument awesome. you've been playing for years too, huh? Your guitar? I've had this one for a long time. I've been playing this since high school and uh, in high school, I was playing it back when I was more into like shred guitar and like metal stuff. Uh, and it worked really well right. for that. And then I switched over to an L4 when I was in college doing jazz and it was mm -hmm. great for that, but it was kind of limiting uh, beyond playing, you know, just stuff with a clean sound and stuff like that. So I went back to this at one point and I, I didn't intend on using it for jazz, but I really liked the way it sounded. So it's a Carvin uh, DC-127. Um, this is from mm -hmm. before they got bought out. But everything on here is just the stock uh, pickups. I haven't really had much work done on it other than a fret job. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, this is what I kind of just ended up using. It's, it's versatile. I can pretty much play any style with it, which I like because I'm kind of I've always been kind of all over the place. So uh, mm -hmm. pretty much does what I need it to do. So yeah, it's working. I did a workshop uh, about a week ago with Lauren Lofsky, a terrific Canadian guitar player about my age. And for years, he's been playing these Yamaha three pickup strats. <laughs> and he gets a beautiful jazz sound on that too. So I think basically, don't assume, I mean, of course, if you want a traditional sound, grab an L5 or something with a big hollow body sound. And right. You know, the PA pickups, et cetera. If you, if you like the traditional sound, fantastic. There's some people who play beautifully with that sound. But don't assume that you have to have a big 
fat jazz box to, to play jazz as we're trying to demonstrate here. I think you can right. really just about anything works. Yeah, absolutely. Like he's been playing on a Yamaha, like a white SG model Yamaha. I've seen that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think maybe, maybe because it's easy for him to travel with, although he has done some things lately with um, hollow body guitars too. He's probably got a bunch of nice hollow bodies. I think he's playing Mofas for a while from, from Italy. They're beautiful instruments. So, um, you know, I think basically whatever feels comfortable for you, you should try. So don't, mm -hmm. don't assume that you have to play anything. That if you find something that works, go for it. Lots of people are playing Telecasters on jazz. Yeah, that's for sure. To Ted, Ted Green and Ed Bickert. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it all comes down to what it sounds. If it sounds good, that's pretty yeah. much, yeah. to me, that's the most important thing, you know? I agree. And a lot of it has to do with what your hands can produce on any instrument, basically. So. Right. Yep. Kind of fun. Got a couple of your friends watching. We've got uh, Hal Merrill Great. and uh, Gil Paris. Great. Hey, hey. Uh -huh. Great to see you both guys. Thank you for watching. Gil, I haven't seen in quite a while. I hope, I hope you're well, Gil. And Hal, thanks for tuning in as always. So maybe I'll try another. What do I do for you? Here's one I've been doing lately that's um, a Hank Jones arrangement, but I'm doing it in an odd meter. I've got this up on my YouTube channel. Uh, so maybe some of you know the Dizzy Gillespie tune Con Alma, kind of a classic uh, tune that he probably wrote in the 40s or 50s. It's got classical harmony. But I found that the melody really subdivides nicely in five. And there's a Hank Jones version of this. Uh, and the Hank Jones version, essentially, he takes the last A down a half step. So the 2-5, which result would, would, it would normally be a deceptive cadence, the last uh, couple chords of the bridge are F minor, B flat 7, and then Dizzy modulates back up to the key of E. Normally that would resolve to E flat, obviously. What Hank Jones did was actually make that a, a, an actual 2-5 that resolves to E flat. So Hank Jones plays the last A down a half step from Dizzy's original key. So it's kind of hmm. clever for those of you who know the tune. That's cool. So um, maybe I'll blow a little bit at first, and I'll take the melody out at the end. Or maybe I'll play the melody up front, too. Uh, so this is Dizzy Gillespie's Kanama in five with a Hank Jones arrangement. I stay down a half step. Thank you. 
Kind of works in five, huh? What do you think? Yeah, that was wild. Wow, that that ending, that half step down at the end, can kind of mess with your ear because it, it already changes. It goes down a half step in the real song, but then another half step for the last day. That was cool. Yeah, exactly. I like yeah, that it's a lot. Kind of a fun arrangement. Yeah, I'm not sure. I have not heard a Hank Jones recording of that, but I've heard from a few people that was his arrangement. I actually did that that arrangement one time with Don Thompson and Terry Clark, uh, Jim Hall's rhythm section up in Toronto, probably 15 years ago. And I said to Don, Terry can play any meter, so I wasn't, and Don too for that matter, so I, I'm sure I'm sure they could handle it. We had we had no rehearsal, we were just playing a little gig. But a listening audience and a fun room. It was a pool hall actually called the Chalkers, and half of the place it was an L-shaped room, half of it was all the pool tables, and the other half was a stage. And people showed up to listen, it was oh. pretty quiet. You'd occasionally hear someone breaking in the other part of the room, but for the most part it was quite quiet. Reg Schwager showed up too, great guitarist. Anyway, I said to Don and Terry, um, hey, would you guys mind playing Con Alma in five? And there's a Hank Jones modulation. And Don said, oh, I play it that way, too. He arrived with oh, nice. himself. It doesn't surprise wow. me. They're both such stellar musicians. So I got a chance to play with Jim Ho's rhythm section once with Terry and Don together. Great fun. And wow, that's amazing. Super, super versatile musicians. They can, Don and Terry can play beautiful big band drumming. He can power a big band with real authority, but he can also play that beautiful open trio setting with Jim Hall that he did. Here's a quick story with that trio. I heard them in the early 80s in Portland. They came here. And the, the room is a small, intimate club in Portland. It was around for a while called Jazz D. Opus. And we're all in the small room waiting for them to come out. And the drum set and the amps and the bass are all there. And they come out. Terry has his left arm in a sling. He had been, uh, <laughs> he had been on the tour and they had, he slipped on the ice someplace in the Midwest and broken his left arm. And did the rest of the tour with his right arm only and his feet. And after about half a tune, I honestly didn't notice. I just listened with my eyes closed anyway. And uh, Terry was willing to do the whole tour with one arm and two legs and did it beautifully. I couldn't believe wow. it. Wow, that's insane. I remember Je when I went to high school, I, I studied with uh, Jeff Fuller in high school. And he I think oh. he played with, he, it was either Terry Clark or Jerry Fuller, one of them. But he said it was like the best right. drummer he's ever played with. Yeah. Well, Jerry Fuller and Terry Clark were both stellar uh, Toronto drummers. You know, there's some very mm -hmm. good players up in Canada, as you probably know. Every one of the cities that I've been to even including some of the smaller cities, uh, in, you know, in Halifax and in the East. Jerry grinaldi has been there for years. He's American, but he's, he knows all the good Canadians and has mm -hmm. had all kinds of great groups up in, in the East. But, you know, Toronto, um, Ottawa, uh, as you move farther west, uh, Saskatoon, Winnipeg, um, Calgary, Edmonton, Vancouver, um, mm -hmm. even on the island in Victoria, Vancouver Island, there's stellar Canadian players in all those cities. In mm -hmm. smaller towns too. My buddy Mike Rudd, who's originally from Edmonton, has been teaching for a while in Nelson's TD College down above Spokane, Washington, and, and that that's a great faculty at that college. So there are plenty of great Canadian musicians. That's awesome. Class. It's good to good to know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they've, and they have a nice festival circuit in the summer too. That's fun. I've done some of those mm -hmm. over the years. Why don't you play something for us? Any sure. Comments from um, anybody before we jump back in? No, I just got uh, just Hal commented on how it sounds beautiful in five, which I completely okay. agree with. Yeah, that melody lines up great in five. You just have to kind of cut off the ending part a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and some melodies subdivide really well in the odd meters. I'm sort of limiting my uh, work with odd meters to seven, four, and five, four. But for those two meters, right. there are a bunch of melodies that subdivide beautifully. I think that's how most of us do it, you know, five, five and seven. Yeah, and if you're in Dave Holland's band, maybe you are playing an 11 8, but uh, I think I'm, I mean, my, <laughs> meter, uh, my sense of working with odd meters sort of stops at 5 4 and 7 4 for now. Yeah, me too. Yeah, the idea of taking a tune and switching it to 9 8 or 11 8 is a little, little more challenging, I think, than the 5 and 7. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, some of my Slovenian friends like 11 8 or 13 8. And I just say, guys, I'm just going to kind of float along at the top. I'll let you do the heavy yeah. lifting. Yeah, good for them. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, because it's, you know, it's a lot of their folk melodies around. The, my friend Marco Chepak, who I play with, I just talked to him about an hour before we went online today. And we've done, we've been friends for 10 years and done a bunch of gigs over there together. And uh, they can, they can really feel those odd meters and they write sometimes in those odd meters and it's beautiful. I think, yeah. uh, you know, if there's an ostinato or some way to feel it, I'm just not going to count one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, over and over again. I just don't think I can do it and, and play right. it. It sounds musical, but, the, but they can. Yeah, that's awesome. Listen. Yeah, yeah maybe for sure. In my old age, I'll work on the odd meters. We'll see. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna do. Uh, I'm gonna do a tune. This is one of my favorite tunes in three to play. This is a song by Sonny Rollins called "Vols Hot." Jim Hall's that's done this one. one a lot. Yeah, beautiful. That's I love the melody. Like Me too. <laughs> Thank you. 
Some of my favorite playing of Sundays that period. Oh, yeah, so beautiful. Him and Clifford Brown together over that tune, just yeah. so beautiful. Yeah, I think so too. I think Sunday's one of my favorites, especially from the early 60s and the group with Jim Hall, obviously. Mm -hmm. How long of a gap was there between the, the bridge and then the album before that? Because he took a break for a while, right, from playing? Yeah, he took a break for a couple of years and uh, he was really was playing on a bridge, although it was the Williamsburg Bridge, I think, not the Brooklyn Bridge. I think he just felt some pressure and just felt like he needed to kind of take a reset and just for the step off the scene, but right in the middle of his popularity, pretty, uh, pretty courageous actually to assume that you hopefully your audience is going to wait for you to come back and you know, what are you going to sound like when you come back and so forth. But obviously he came back stronger than ever. So, mm -hmm. but it's so hard to find an audience and to build up an audience. So to step away from it for a couple of years it would feel like an awfully long time. To take Especially back time. before, before the internet too. <laughs> I, know, <laughs> you know? I know, I know, I know. Yeah, he's always kind of marched to his own drummer. I think I don't know him, but he seems like he's a man of sort of strong opinions and convictions and served him pretty well, I think, over the years. Yeah, how old is he now? Sonny now, I think, is mid to late 80s, and I think, unfortunately, retired from playing, but I think still in right. health otherwise. And, uh, you know, I see still, still occasionally see pictures of him and him weighing in on the Internet. So I think he hopefully still feels like he has a creative life. I think at some point when you feel like you're 
physical stamina is not up to playing at the sort of very high standard you set for yourself. Maybe you just step back and maybe curate some of your mm-hmm. some of your discography or teach or just try to do something so that you still feel like you're engaged creatively, but maybe just not out touring and performing, you know. Right. At some point yeah, it's always time. great to see that from right. It's great to see some of those older guys when they can do like Wayne Shorter. I see him always doing stuff online. So he seems very engaged still. And it's great to so. uh you know. I'm hopefully still still composing and I saw a picture of him fairly recently with a giant piece of score paper. He's obviously involved in doing something, either reviewing some of his earlier work or or composing something new. Who knows? I think I heard somewhere that he tries to compose one thing every day, even if it's, you know, um, just a minor thing. He tries to write at least one idea every day. Yeah, I've heard that from other folks, too. Just compose something Mm -hmm. every day. I'm the opposite of that. I'll just compose. Yeah, me too. (laughs) Right. But, you know, everyone has a different, maybe, hey, maybe I'll play a Wayne Shorter song since we've been talking about yeah, there you one go. of my favorites. Yeah, I don't play a lot of his music, but I sure love it. He was one I put on my YouTube channel a while ago. It's one of the ballads from the 60s when he was composing and playing with Miles. It's on, I'm not sure if it's ESP, which record, do you know which record Fall is on? It's one of my favorite ballads. That's on a, a Miles record? Yeah, I mean, when he was with, that group was together about five years, and a lot of the um, material that they recorded were compositions from Wayne. And mm. I think it's you know, mid '60s, like either ESP or I don't think it's on there for TV, but one of those records from the mid '60s. Mm. So here's Fall. For cool. Sure. I don't know if you play this one. No. Thank you. 
beautiful, beautiful. simple melody, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, some, of, some of Wayne's ballads are some of my very favorite ballads to play. That's not oh, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Or is that such great yeah, melodies? Yeah, I mean, they just they just sort of pour out of him. I think from the time he was quite young, even playing with Blakey, he was composing then, or even younger, I think. And I think he studied classical mm -hmm. music as a kid too, growing up in Newark. Very unusual. I think he went to a performing arts high school in Newark. Not he's from New Jersey. About his background. Yeah, he's from Newark. Oh wow, I didn't know. That. Yeah, a bunch of folks from Newark who are incredible players. Mm -hmm. and he came up probably. Yeah, he came up around the time of John Coltrane, roughly. So early, mm -hmm. early mid fifties. And I think his probably his, his first important gig in terms of exposure was with Blakey, but he was doing other things before that too. Mm -hmm. But a lot of music he composed for the Jazz Messengers. He was in that group with Lee Morgan and maybe some other folks too. And then Miles in the early '60s for five years, and then you know as a leader ever since then. Obviously in Weather Report, so in you know some of the earliest fusion, and then had his own acoustic quartet probably for maybe 15 years with John Patitucci, Brian Blade, and Danilo Perez. So that's probably mm -hmm. his last long run as a leader that kind of ended fairly recently. So mm -hmm. then his long collaborations with Herbie on and off. They did a duo record. It's pretty interesting, and they did some touring as a duo. I remember the first time I went to the Newport Jazz Festival, I got there, I was there for Saturday and Sunday, and I went there at Saturday morning, and the first thing I see is just Herbie and Wayne just come out and they just really? played free, they just played free for like a half hour against each other, and I was like, all right, you can't top this, <laughs> that's it, wow. you know, starting yeah, the morning, festival like that. The they put him on in a morning slot, interesting, great way to start yeah. the day. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was pretty. I was, you know, it was a lot for ten thirty in the morning. I was like, oh my god, this is uh, this they intense. Ten thirty a.m. Funny. Wow. Yeah. yeah. People are just probably stumbling around trying to drink coffee and wake up. Funny. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank God bless them. Awesome. I mean, they get they you know they have a, a actually they had an all star band. Uh, I think this is probably maybe fifteen years ago now with Dave Holland and uh, Brian Blade, and their first gig was actually in Oregon, and they had an open rehearsal in Southern Oregon at a college, and a friend of mine went. And uh, it was interesting, at one point they're playing one of Wayne's tunes and he says to Herbie, no, it should sound more like rain there, more like rain. Herbie said, okay, Wayne, I got it. Wow. I'm not sure. He, he didn't say play this chord or this harmony. He just had these beautiful ways of uh, musical shorthand because he and Herbie had been, had been friends at that point for so long. Okay. And he could just communicate things in sort of non-musical terms like nature terms, which I thought was interesting. That's Wayne awesome. That's uh, there, yeah. uh, funny, huh? <laughs> Yeah, that's He's their probably, lingo after all these years. <laughs> He's probably an interesting guy to hang out with, I have a feeling. He loves sci-fi and all sorts of non-musical things, too. I get nice. comic books, all sorts of graphic. Comics. Really? Wow, that's awesome to know. Yeah. <laughs> into all that, too. Hey, she, we want to play one more, and then maybe we can uh, trade on some tunes. Sure, yeah, I'll do a Wayne Shorter tune as well. You got me thinking. Um, Excellent. This is one that I really like. Uh, I'm going to do uh, Deluge. I forget what. It might be on, it's on Speak No Evil. Is it on Deluge? Is that on Speak No Evil? Well, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think when I hear the melody, I might recognize it, but that time. Let me see. Exactly. Let me see what album it's on. I'm just curious. Deluge. I think. Yeah. Um, it's, on, it's on Juju. Okay. Yeah, that, okay. that period of, you know, his, all those blue note recordings he did as a leader, there's so many great tunes. Deluge, I'm, yeah, so sure I've even, I'm sure I've heard this one, but I'm not sure if I've read one played besides Wayne. I'll look forward to hearing what you do with it. Yeah, pretty easy. Pretty easy one, actually. That's why I'm doing it. <laughs> one of the easier Wayne Shorter okay. songs to get through. Right. Good. Very good. All right. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
with enough little harmonic twists and turns that it's fun to play, I'm sure. Yeah, I'd like to learn a little more. Wayne, I only probably had half a dozen of his tunes memorized, but he's got probably dozens, if not hundreds of tunes. So I think there are a few composers I'd like to dig into a little more deeply. He's one of them. Yeah, absolutely. I, I used to know more uh, before COVID, back when I was playing uh, his songs more regularly. But those are the, I feel like the, songs like his are ones if you put them down for a while, you definitely have to revisit them. Not exactly a, a lot of straightforward <laughs> functional harmony. Yeah. Yeah, you know. exactly. But if I hear a melody I like that's not a diatonic in nature, based on the changes, I just try to connect arpeggios. We've talked about this before in some of our classes. Right. Just find chord shapes in arpeggios so we can find some melodies, essentially. But it is more challenging if it's obviously not diatonic harmony. Yeah, and th this song is interesting, too, because a lot of the non-diatonic stuff, it kind of you can almost get away with an E-flat minor pentatonic scale for most of it, even like when it goes yep. to... Um, right here. Right. Like two five the f sharp to b flat like a lot of those notes kind of still line up in e flat minor pentatonic you know? yes they do yep i mean it, just because the tune feels bluesy it feels nice to reference some of that harmony in the, in the soloing too obviously yeah it's got some cool intro too i never learned the intro but he does like some some sort of like rubato yeah. a couple of weird notes and then they land on this uh dissonant chord so. I, I don't recall the intro but uh, i'm sure it's interesting any comments or thoughts from friends who are watching? Um, just people just uh, saying everything sounds nice. Thank you, everybody, for oh, the great. kind words. But uh, no questions so far. That. If anybody, okay. anybody watching, you have any questions, uh, shoot them into the chat. We're happy to talk yeah, about anything. Yeah, or comments. Happy to hear from you. And you're very welcome to watch for free, everybody. If you like what you're here and feel inclined to donate a little something, Mike put up a link to my PayPal account. And uh, any, any don donations of any amount are appreciated but not required. We're happier with us. 
Absolutely. And I have John's uh, YouTube channel link in the description as well. If you're not subscribed already, be sure to go over there and check that out. He has a lot of great material, posts a new video every Sunday, right? You have your Sunday sessions. Yep. And, and, and yours too, Mike, obviously. Mike has a great YouTube channel as well. He's got many more subscribers than I do, but I'm sure he'd appreciate your subscribing too if you haven't already. I'm also up on the Truefire YouTube channel. We might put something up there together in the future. So they have... Um, something like 450,000 subscribers for the True Fire YouTube channel. And if you go up under, just type in True Fire on YouTube and then my name, and you'll see that I'm also posting a weekly video there on the True Fire YouTube channel. Different one. Oh, so we didn't even mention, too, the new people. class that we have uh, through Mike's Master Class. Yes, absolutely. We just released a new yes. class. Yeah. I think we now have six, right? Is this our sixth yep, one? Yep, this is our sixth one, so. yep. So, yeah, the Mike's Master Class Society, if you're not aware of it, is a great site. Those are individual lessons you can buy, and I've got about, I think, 40 up there, six of which are with Mike. We just posted a new class where we just go through harmony, talk about some of our approaches to some of the different modes, layering more complex harmony on top of basic harmony, how to move through changes. So we, we cover quite a bit of material in there, and I think uh, people seem to like them. So if you like some of our previous classes, you probably like number six. I'll do a little this week. Maybe I'll do a little post just with a little sample of it and put a link to uh, be great. where to get it. If people are interested. Yeah, please do, Mike. That would be great. I try to spread the word too when they come out. So should we trade? Let's should we play a little more together? I'd love to play something Absolutely. with you while we're interacting. Maybe trading some courses. Um, that sounds great. You had suggested meditation as an option, which is a good kind of standby Joe Beam jam session basso that that we both like. So should we try a little on meditation? Sure. Sounds good. Good. We can just just do a little. So when we don't need to, probably everybody knows the melody, you all can sing along. One thing I've been doing, if there's anyone out there who is a guitarist, or any instrument for that matter, just play along with us. I've been doing this a little bit in some of the uh, classes. It can be fun where folks just mute the mics and play along with us, although we can't see anybody now. If you have your instrument and feel like joining us on a tune that you know, please do. It can be fun to, to play along with us in real time. So mm -hmm. let's trade some courses. Uh, I can go first or you can go first. Uh, you can go first, sure. Okay. Not too fast. Let's take it kind of a nice, relaxed quarter note. And I feel okay, Mike. So I'll take Sounds a course and I'll hand it over to you. Let's go back and forth a few times. One, two, one, two. Mm. Thank you. 
let's go around once more. That that was fun. Yeah, that was awesome. Maybe, maybe we'll try another. Like, let's let's, let's try a swinger. Maybe where we alternate some eights as opposed to full choruses. That could be fun. Yeah, I didn't think. Yeah, I didn't even think about that till before. That is a long form, as is the case with okay. most of his tunes. Yeah. Hey, it's so a Sunday. People can just chill with their with their coffee in their morning or their with their brunch and listen to a stretch out That's a little. Yeah. Let's why don't we take a swinger and alternate some maybe some eights or some you know some shorter like a shorter form. Um, do you know the tune? Uh, do, you know soon, do you know "Soon" by Gershwin? Soon, yeah. Actually, I, I have to play that one. I have a little, little reharmonization I can share with you on that one. That's a good one. I learned that because sure. I heard a, it's on the John Schofield "Works for Me" record. Maybe we talked about this, and uh, so then I picked it up. Um, I, I usually play it in E flat. Do you have a preference key wise? Yeah, E flat is fine. All right, super. Let me just show you this. We don't have to. You don't necessarily have to incorporate this in uh, in your solo, but. I have a friend who's a great trumpet player, a ranger composer in Seattle named Jim Knapp, trumpet player. And um, he took that tune and put a little, almost sounds not exactly like giant steps, but there's a, he puts a little half step modulation to D at the very end of the tune. He does this. Uh, and then back to B flat. So you don't necessarily have to reference that, but it's kind of fun. Nice. Cool. Wait, this um, one, he does a, a reharm of this on Works For Me? Well, 
no, no, it's just, this is actually, the Schofield version doesn't do this, but the Jim Knapp version, it's just, it's a very subtle reharm because he just slips in a modulation to the key of D right before you go back to the top of the tune. Uh, oh, that's neat. So the second half would be... fun right it's just subtle nice. but it's there yeah, cool. so you don't, you don't necessarily have to listen to from, from uh, that cannibal adderley cannibal adderley ah, does this on uh, that's I a think great it's tune the, the album them dirty blues yeah Man, i'd love to hear can what cannibal does on this i'm sure it's swinging and great anything by cannibal is to me it's just great i don't know oh, as much yeah. of his music as i'd like to but i just love his playing so much i went through a big cannibal obsession when i was in college i transcribed a bunch of his stuff some of the later stuff actually gets a little bit weird um compared to yeah. some of the earlier stuff like he had that zodiac album you know, I mean, he got a little more. He got a little more experimental uh, later on, based kind on of fusion stuff that I had yeah. heard. Yeah. yeah, he was doing some fusiony stuff. Actually, I, I did a gig one time in the early '80s with Roy McCurdy, who worked with Cannonball for about 10, 11 years, and he said Cannonball was an incredible leader. They had pensions and paid vacations in the oh, '60s, yeah. and Cannonball was incredibly organized and just a sweet, funny guy apparently to hang out with. I never met him, but everyone I know who had any interaction with him said he was a gentleman and just very sweet and just great. I mean, he only lived to be he was 40 a school years, teacher, right? Unfortunately. He was a school teacher in Florida, and he showed up at an age around 29 or 30 in New York and just blew everybody away. Nat had a longer career, and Nat played well, too. You know, Nat could hold his own with Cannonball when they played together. And uh, But Cannonball's one of my very favorites, just that lyrical, lilting, oh, beautiful sure. sound, and his ideas okay. are so incredible. And just take all the facility in the world, but he used it really in service to, to you know, to playing beautiful solos. You always know it's him. I'll take one note and you know it's him. Yeah, in. that's right. Yeah, that beautiful singing lyrical sound with a just faint hint of vibrato and and just that beautiful eighth note placement a little on top in the, in the best way, you know, just anticipating yeah. the time a little. He was incredible. I loved him too. Absolutely. Well, let's, should we try some, um, it's a, it's th as soon as a 32 bar tune, yeah? Should we try some eights? Sure. Let's try. You want to go first? Any tempo you like. One, two, one. Great. Thank you. 
was fun. Yeah, great tune. I blanked on one of the changes I haven't played in a while. It's a great one, though. He's got a sort of an interesting back cycle. Mm -hmm. It sort yeah. of cycles further back in the in the changes than you'd expect. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a clever tune. I like it a lot, yeah, too. The second, yeah, the second end, uh, half. Well, I missed the... Um... different the right. second time compared to the first time right exactly yeah it's, it's a good one yeah. hey mike it was great fun today as always and let's plan on doing another one of these you know in a month or two and i would love to also collaborate with you on another class uh, sooner rather than later so thanks to everyone who tuned in we sure appreciate your watching with us and it's great to play with mike and i always enjoy teaching with him too so we will do some more collaborations uh, before we sign off any other uh, questions or comments from anybody watching no, just a bunch of uh, nice, nice comments telling us everything sounds good. Great. No questions. Okay. But, um, okay. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Really appreciate it. And John, always a pleasure to do these with you. And I look forward to Likewise, more of Mike. these classes and uh, yeah, more live streams in the future. So thanks again. Yeah, let's. You are going to stay in touch, and I'll, I'll connect with you very soon online. And again, thanks for everyone for watching, folks. Uh, please stay safe and healthy, and we hope to see you all soon. Sounds good. Thanks again for watching, everybody. And John, a pleasure as always. I will. Uh,